Well, welcome everyone. Um, before we get started, uh, we should acknowledge that Western's main campus is located on the ancestral homelands of the Coast Salish peoples who for eons have lived in and cared for this part of the earth from the mountains to the islands. We express our deepest respect and gratitude for their enduring care and protection of our shared lands. Uh, my name is Eric Worley. I'm a professor of finance here at Western. It's great to see some familiar folks registered for this event and uh, the finance and marketing department of the College of Business and Economics and the Western Washington University Alumni Association are excited to welcome you to today's webinar, Creating and Executing a Lifetime Investment Strategy. I am pleased to introduce our speaker tonight, or today, I should say, uh, Paul Merriman. Uh, Paul graduated from Western in 1966 and is an award-winning financial educator, author, and nationally recognized expert on investing. He retired in, 20, retired in 2012 from the wealth management company he founded in 1983, but since then he has been busier than ever. Driven by a passion for financial education, uh, he established the Merriman Financial Education Foundation and has dedicated his retirement years to providing investors of all ages with free information and tools. Uh, these tools can help you make informed decisions in your own best interest and successfully implement your own retirement savings program. Paul and his small home-based team have produced hundreds of weekly podcasts, market watch articles and videos, some of these award-winning, <laughs> along with books, articles by experts, and unique research to help make you help you make wise financial and investment decisions. After this talk, I encourage you to check out some of the resources on his website, paulmerriman.com. If you are interested in diving deeper into what you learned tonight, as a fellow Viking, Paul cares deeply about your future, and we are grateful to have him here to share his insights and advice on creating and executing a lifetime investment strategy. Some of you have, uh, have already submitted questions with your registration and we appreciate those. Uh, please use the Zoom Q&A feature uh, at the bottom, bottom of the middle of your screen to send us any questions that may come to mind. And uh, Paul will be responding to those questions via follow-up follow podcast late next week and, and you'll be invited to download that. Uh, we also recommend that you use a speaker view as part of Zoom, and, and let's with that, let's get started. I'll hand it over. Please welcome Paul Merriman. Take it away, Paul. Oh, thank you, Eric, very much. And I, I just want to make sure that uh, you all understand, I loved going to Western. I still love Western, and every time I get a chance to teach, often classes uh, there on campus, it is, uh, it is a, a, a special opportunity for me. And, but this is serious business for me because uh, I am not in the entertainment business. I am here to try to help you make some huge decisions, decisions that I, I believe without any question are life-changing for you, for your family, and when you retire, how you retire, how you traveled in retirement, these decisions, I, I will do my best to convince you are in fact uh, life-changing. Uh, Eric made the comment that, that we have lots of information and the, and the goal here is, is to give you the information that you would need to do this yourself. Now, I don't mean that it won't make you just generally a more uh, intelligent investor, it should. But my goal for you, and you're going to see why in just a few minutes, is that you will be able to make decisions that are in your best interest and your best interest only. Uh, and uh, that that in and of itself could lead to some really amazing long-term returns for you. The do-it-yourself investor is special. And the, 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 for me as an educator, as a teacher, it's a real challenge because some of you, you would just like me to tell you, do go buy this particular fund. That's it. You don't need any more information. You may conclude for some reason that, that you trust this information. And I would just give you the name of that fund. And by the way, you will see the names of mutual funds, exchange traded funds that I trust. But the bottom line is those kinds of investors I always am concerned for because oftentimes if you don't dig a little deeper, you don't get the information that you need 
to create realistic expectations because in many ways, the most important aspect of our work, and when I say our, we are a team of people who, who are donating our time. There's no profit motive for us in this process. It truly is about you. But for the person who says, yes, I want to be a do-it-yourself investor, the challenge is this. You have just said, I want to be an investment advisor, and I have one client, me, the most important client in the world. And the challenging aspect of investing is not just that you understand this, this historical data that I will share with you, but you're going to need to understand yourself and the psychological hurdles that investors face and I'll do my best to get you started in that direction. Now, it all starts with a with a millions and millions of bits of information that you could understand about investing. It is a, a, it's a topic that we have hundreds of years of data on. And then you, you have to then decide about this information. How much do you know that you know? Because most of you probably have some general understandings. You know, you know the difference between a stock and a bond. You may know the difference between a, a no-load mutual fund and a load mutual fund. There are a lot of things that you've probably been exposed to. But obviously, there's a lot more. And you're going to get some of that today. And I want to warn you, I give you so much in this hour and a half that I think if you're really going to get it comprehended and put it to use, you probably want to watch this more than once, or as Eric suggested, uh, go to our website, and we have over 700 articles, podcasts, and videos there, but I'm going to show you at the end how to get the very best out of that website. Then there is the piece of pie that represents what you know you don't know, and I can tell you right now, the thing that you don't know, and I don't know, and Eric doesn't know, nobody knows, is the future. And that is what we'd all like to know. So all we can do is we can learn about the past and then assume there's going to be something similar in the future. Then there's the piece of pie that represents what you don't know you don't know. And the problem, of course, is you have no idea how big that piece of pie is because you don't know you don't know it. And one of the things we need to do as investors is understand there is so much that we don't even know to know that massive diversification is one of the smartest things that you can do. That goes a long way to protecting you against the things you don't even know that you're supposed to know. Then there is a piece of pie, and this is the most interesting in some ways, that represent what you know you know, but you are wrong. And what those are, and there are hundreds of, of very common situations, we call them the myths of investing. There are things that people believe about investing that are simply not true. There's, not, there's no evidence of that. Now, somebody might say, for example, investing in the stock market is like going to Las Vegas, or it's just, it's just gambling or speculating. Yes, you can do that. And yes, there's somebody on Wall Street that will help you do that, gladly help you do that. But the fact is, that is not what we're talking about here today. We're talking about investing. And investing is not like going to Las Vegas. But I'll let you uh, hold that thought for a little bit. We'll get back to it. Then, and here's the fascinating one for me as a teacher, and in a sense, every teacher has this problem. We know information we would like you to know. And then we share it with you, and you know it. And you may even know it to the extent that you can say, ah, ha, yeah, I get it, I get it. But then you don't do anything about it. And what can we do? It's one thing to educate. How do we motivate you to move to action? And I'm going to tell you the best thing that I know 
is if I can convince you that some very small steps that you can take will individually lead to a million dollar additional bit of money for you to spend later in life or lead to others, maybe that will be the motivating factor. Or maybe you'll be motivated by wanting to do the right thing. Because obviously, uh, others do not want you to do the right thing. Uh, we, we, Bernie Madoff did not want you to do the right thing. He was a con artist. He, he, he built people out of billions and billions of dollars. You take the right steps and you never have to worry about a Bernie Madoff in your life. So I want to expand what you know about investing today. I also want to motivate you, I hope, to moving to action. Now, from the big picture aspect of investing, now I'm talking investing, I'm not talking taxes so much, I'm not talking about estate planning, I'm not talking about how to save money, That there are things you're going to have to learn on your own, or I'll give you resources that I think you can learn those things from. But investing, the big picture to me is this, they're just a handful of steps. You have to be able to identify the equity. That's, that's another word for stock. The equity asset classes, the groups of stocks that are built historically to benefit you. You then need to figure out ways to put those groups together. There are huge differences. You can have one part of the stock market going up while the other part is going down. I want you to understand how that happens, why it happens, how to do something to keep it from being you having everything and the thing that all that just goes down and while other people are making money, there's a right way to do it. Then there is the question, how much bonds to have in your portfolio along with those stocks? That's for people who don't want to take a lot of risk. They want to reduce the risk. They want to reduce the return. They want to have a sense of comfort. I'm going to show you how to do some of that. Now, what I will not dive in today to, I will not divide, dive into taking distributions out of your portfolio in retirement. I'll show you where to get that information, but I don't have time to do that as well. And then, all of this is fairly easy, but where it tends to get kind of complex for people is selecting the mutual funds or the exchange traded funds. There are over 20,000 to choose from. And how do you select the best? I'll show you how at least I believe that you select the best and hopefully forget about the rest. At the end of the day, you're sitting there, maybe you're maybe not trusting me because you don't know enough about me, but I don't care whether it's about me or anybody you help you hear from in this industry. How are you going to figure out who to trust? This is a huge decision. And we're in a world for whatever reason where trust does not come easily. What do we know? We know that we don't trust politicians. We don't trust salesmen. Um, we, we, we don't trust uh, the press. We don't trust Wall Street. It, typically, these days, it seems like whatever political party you're in, you don't trust the other party. Well, what are we going to trust? I am here to make the case, and this is a very important part of, I think, what makes my work, our work as a foundation, different than a lot of other work that you will be exposed to over the years. I want you to follow the math. I want you to follow the history of investing. I want to do everything I can to get you out of the the, the responding emotionally or, or, or responding to what just happened. Oh, inflation or, or oh, oh, we got, a, we got a, a, a debt crisis. Those events are not what investing is about. It's the journey. And the journey of investing to be successful is not one of focusing on today or the things that that that, that the news wants you to focus on. You know, they they got to attract your eyeballs, and they can't attract your eyeballs talking about something 30, 40 years from now. 
Well, I want your eyeballs and your brain focused on 30 to 40 years. And the thing I love about the math is it's guaranteed. I cannot talk about the stock market very often and use the word guaranteed. But about the math, I can use the word guaranteed. And this is a very important guarantee. Table one, by the way, there's there's a, a PDF that I, I don't know whether it's been distributed to you. And, and if it hasn't, uh, I will hope that they will put the... Uh, uh, the link to that PDF, and maybe you got an email uh, with it in there, but you'll be able to see all of these tables uh, in those PDFs uh, later if, if you would like. Anyway, table one. Notice I'm talking about the implications of adding a half of 1% to your return. I want you to understand how big a deal that is. And as, in fact, later, I'll even make a big deal out of an extra one-tenth of 1%. I'm gonna focus on this one half of 1%. And I got two scenarios here, two people, however you wanna think about it. But we're talking about the math, the math of making 8% a year during the 40 years that you put money away. And for this particular discussion, we're talking about putting away $6,000 a year for 40 years, which means that it's $240,000. You're going to make 8% during the years of accumulation, and then you're going to retire and you're going to make 6%. And then when you retire, you're going to take out 4% a year, the withdrawal rate, but you're going to be making 6% a year in retirement. Why the lower return? Because you have less risk tolerance. So I am at age 79, very conservatively invested along with my wife. And we have risk tolerance that should be very different than yours. And it is. Here's what I want to know. What are the implications of making 8% and taking out four and making six and all of those, those numbers? Well, here it is right here. Here's the math. At age for a 65, if you've done this for 40 years, you've got almost $1.7 million. You start taking out that 4% a year, you take it out for 30 years, you're going to take about $2.6 million in distributions. And when you die at age 95, you are going to leave to your heirs about $2.8 million. That's the math. Now, here's where that extra half a percent becomes a big deal. Because at the end of your life, when you're gone, we can all look at how you did. Well, we won't actually be able to look, but at least in theory we could. And we could say, oh, how much money did, did they take out of their portfolio? There it is. You took out 2.6 million. How much did they leave to their heirs? You left 2.8 million. How much do those two numbers total up to? About 5.5 million. That is the return you got. You don't have to think of it in terms of, well, was it 4.92%? That's not what's important. It's the cash you got out and this cash in essence or the investments you left to others. But now the half a percent pops up here. What instead of eight, you get eight and a half. What instead of six, you get six and a half. In the free book that you're going to have a link to here in this presentation entitled, We're Talking Millions, in that book, there are 12 different ways that you could, in essence, add a half a percent. So it's not like there's a shortage of ways to do it. And that 8%, by the way, that's not a number we just took out of thin air. That is a number that with a very conservative portfolio and I'm going to tell you about it later, that you don't have to do anything for the next 40 years, but, but, but sit with this one particular investment, you have an awfully good opportunity to make an 8% compound rate of return. The extra half a percent, instead of having 1.7 million to retire uh, on at age 65, it's 1.9. Instead of taking out 2.6, you take out 3.2 million. Instead of leaving 2.8 million, you leave 3.7 million. Instead of 5.5 million in total between distributions of what you leave to others, it's almost $7 million. You have added. 
you have added an extra one and a half million dollars because you found a way to make an extra half of 1%. That is what my work is about. One, for you to know about it, and two, for you to do something about it. Here's another example, but instead of a half a percent, it is 1%. And you can see the bottom line. Now you are up, instead of to 7 million, you're up to almost $9 million. Now you have added about $3.5 million to your lifetime income and leaving. And what you needed was 1%. Well, let me tell you the magic of that. If you learn to do it yourself with no load mutual funds, and it's easy to do, again, we tell you exactly how to do it. And others do too. We're not the only ones that provide this kind of information for nothing. But the bottom line is, you will typically, once you have enough money to hire an investment advisor, they'll charge you about 1%, commonly, sometimes less, sometimes more, which means if you don't hire somebody, you keep that 1%. That is the simple thing you need to do to make 9% instead of 8 Now, there are lots more ways to do that. But this is one of the reasons I want you to do this yourself is because I know you're smart enough to do it. You got through college. I teach high school kids how to do it. They get it. So I know that you can. Some people are just afraid of investing because they think it's too complex. That is because Wall Street wants you to think it's too complex so that you need them. You do not need them. Now, you are in a partnership. You may think you're taking care of this yourself. You're doing this, this yourself. No, you have to do it with a partner. And the partner is the market, the stock market. Now, you don't know them personally, but I can tell you that in the portfolio that my wife and I have, and you can have a portfolio just like it, we may have more in our portfolio than you do, but the bottom line is you can own all the same companies we do through mutual funds. And we know that all those people that work for all those corporations that are held by all those mutual funds are working for us, millions of them going to work every day. They are the business you own. Obviously, they don't know you personally. They don't feel like they have to answer to you, but I can tell you they're answering to the shareholders in general at the end of the day. The reason I mention this is because I want you to understand your part of the partnership is every bit as important as those people that are going to work every day because it is your investments that makes this thing run. And to the extent that you wait to start investing, I'm going to show you that in just a minute. But what if on top of making that extra 1%, you also upped the ante instead of just putting away $6,000 a year, what if you every year increase that by 3%? So in the second year, you put away an extra $180, an extra $15 a month. It has a huge impact on you. And you can see that right here in this table. Because in scenario four there, you've done the same thing, 9%, 7%. But you raise the ante that you put in, the commitment to growing your company. And you'll notice instead of an extra million and a half dollars, you've got an extra $3.5 million here that you made because you put in an extra about 200, a uh, little over $200,000. You have an extra $3.5 million. And one more, by the math, guaranteed. Let's say you wait until you're 30. Somebody else starts at age 25. They put in five more years than you did. And I'm just going to tell you, 
that cost you four seven million dollars if you did not join that person and put that that early money in there that small a reasonably small amount of extra money has totaled another 4.6 million you you now by doing these handful of things to make your life better in the future and by the way saving six thousand dollars a year with the kind of money that you're going to be making as you grow within whatever you're doing you're going to put a lot more money than this away. So this is just the beginning. The next part is not guaranteed. I can tell you that in a sense that the, that the history of the market in a sense is guaranteed. But the fact is nobody can suggest that they can guarantee they're going to get you what it got in the past. This is what the risk of investing is always going to expose you to, a risk that the future will not look like the past. If we could say that we could guarantee it, then that would be a really big deal. Now I'm gonna show you some numbers though that could say, here's the worst that happened to people, here's the best that happened to people, more than likely you're gonna get something in between. First, fork in the road that we come to now, where it's not about you, it's about what you have invested in, about the market, is this huge decision between stocks and bonds. Stocks represent ownership, bonds represent debt. You have actually loaned the government, loaned a corporation money, for which they say, we promise to pay you 4% for the next 30 years. And if we do well, all you're going to get is 4%. Whereas in the stock market, they don't guarantee you anything. They simply say, come on board. You're a, you're a shareholder, just like everybody else. We're doing our best. We're trying to keep our products uh, up to date. We're trying to collect our bills. We're trying to manufacture high quality products. All those things that a business is going to have to do. But look at here. Here's the return over the last 94 years. By the way, in about three or four weeks, we'll have all of the tables you're going to see will be updated through the end of last year. But here's what we know through the end of 2021 was that a short-term government bond or like a treasury bill versus an intermediate term, a bond that matures maybe let's say in five or seven years, or a long-term bond that the government might issue that matures and pays you back what you put in, in let's say 10, 20, even 30 years. These are all different levels of risk, these three different kinds of bonds. But what I want you to really notice, two things, that the worst year that that short-term government bond ever had was a very, very small loss. On the other hand, the return it got was $100 grew to 2000 The long-term, and by the way, that was based on a 3.3% compound rate of return. Money, growing on money. The money always being put in and continuing to compound. On the other hand, the long-term bond, it compounded at 5.6. So a $100 investment grew to 16,500. So there you kind of have a range. $100 grows to 2,000 or 16,000 over 94 years. I talked about trying to get you an extra half of 1%. Look what happens when we put that money into four different kinds of asset class equities. For example, there is what they call the S&P 500, or it is commonly seen as a mutual fund or, or asset class that's called large cap blend. Huge company, I mean, really big, the biggest companies, 500 of them. And they've, they've looked at the return of the biggest companies historically all the way back to 1928. And what they see is during that period of time, the compound rate of return was about 10. 
So $100 grew to over 900,000. Then there's the large, oh, by the way, that word blend, that means partly growth and partly value. Growth and value are very different kinds of stocks. Growth companies are great companies with a great future, with, 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 with sales growing quickly. Really, people, people really love those companies because they have a, that great future. They are willing then to pay a very high price to own them. Then there are companies that really people aren't all that excited to be in because they're 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 what they call value. They're kind of doggy. They they're okay. They're not they're they're not going out of business. They just aren't in the kinds of industries that that we want to be in. You might not be very excited, for example, about a a, a mining company or a company that manufactures just a metal widgets. You want to be in the more high-tech part of the industries, so you're going to be more in growth. But it turns out that these value companies actually make a better rate of return over time. Doesn't make any sense until you realize that those companies have higher risk. The great growth companies have lower risk but they're priced at very high prices because of that. And the value companies are not, but in the end, the value companies do better. So notice there's a 1% difference in the 94 year return. Well, that 1% takes you from a little under a million to a little over 2 million. Or if you looked at smaller companies that were blend companies would take you to 4.5 million based on about another 1%. And then the small companies that are out of favor, that are valued, they even go higher up to about 13 million. And then you can put them together and you can build portfolios of combinations of them. I'll get back to that in a few minutes. But can you see why when we look over a long period of time, and now we're not talking 94 years now, I can say. I, I, I just put money, my wife and I just put money um, in an account for a little girl, our granddaughter, who was born on November 2nd last year. We put her retirement money away for her. Not all of it, but enough to make a difference. She, in fact, will probably have that money invested for 94 years. So then how much diversification do you need? Can you just have your money in the S&P 500? By the way, what about just putting your money in the, the, the biggest 10 great growth companies? All right, they may not be the most profitable, but they're great companies. All of the research says, don't trust anything too much. Dr. Bessenbinder out of the University of, of um, Arizona or, or Arizona State University, um, what his study showed along, he did this with some other academics, is that they looked at all of the public companies going back to 1926, I think, actually. And they asked the question, do stocks outperform treasury bills? Some do. As a matter of fact, it turns out that about 4% of the companies, 4% of all of the public companies that are around since 1926, they made huge profits. The other 96% averaged, compounded at 3% a year. Many of them went broke. So what the academics will tell us, and I trust what I call University Street way more than I do Wall Street. I don't have any reason that I can find to trust Wall Street, but University Street does some really great research that we should all know about. And I think this is important. What this says is, is if you want to go for that 10% or maybe that 11 or 12 or 13 that I showed you in those different equity asset classes, that you are better off owning all the stocks. And that is what my message is. And it is the message of of, uh, and I'm not an academic. I'm, I'm just an old-fashioned teacher here. I'm not claiming that I did created any of this research. People did, though, and I conclude along with them, I want you to be in many, many, many stocks, not a couple. I want you to be in mutual funds, by the way, where you automatically own 
a thousand or two thousand or five thousand stocks automatically. You put in a hundred dollars, you got it. You're treated like a multimillionaire. In fact, you're treated like a billionaire when you put in a hundred dollars because not only can you have this massive diversification, but you can have it at low expense. When I was your age, I would have to pay a commission to buy a mutual fund, to even get into it. They would take about 9% right off the top for a salesperson. Today, you no longer have to pay that commission. Oh yeah, they're still out there trying to sell them, but you don't have to buy them, I promise. There is no problem. As a matter of fact, there are literally hundreds of us that are trying to get people to put their money, not only in no load commission free, but it costs money to manage a mutual fund or an exchange traded fund. But you can buy them where the expenses are very high. You can spend one or 2% a year, not of what you make, but of what you have inside that mutual fund. 2% of everything you have in there every year, they're taking it home to their family rather than you taking it home to your family. And so I want you to be in low expense funds and you can buy funds. And in a few cases, they actually have no expenses, but most of these low expense funds, it may cost you one tenth of 1% a year, not, not 2%, not 1%. One tenth of one percent and less. And the big decision for you, and I hope if you don't take anything else but this away with you, there is this fork in the road between active management and passive management in terms of ownership of these equity companies, these, these public corporations. The active group. It sounds like what you're going to want because they're going to say to you, let me help you. I can beat the market. Oh, I know there are 500 great companies out there, but did you know a lot of those companies really aren't very good? And I'm going to put together a portfolio. I'll only use companies from the 500, but I'm going to pick the best ones. I know how to do the research so that I can create a portfolio, a mutual fund, in fact, that, that, that may or may not have a commission to get in, that may or may not have low funds, normally not low funds, because they got to pay me, the genius, the guru, who knows the right companies to put in that portfolio. And oh, by the way, did I tell you that not only do I know the right companies to put the money into, I know when to get in and I know when to get out. And you're thinking, ah, more money for me. If they know what to buy and not buy all 500, because surely some of those 500 are dogs. And yes, they are. The question is, show me the evidence. Show me the evidence that people have been able to do that very thing that you say that you can do. And they could say, oh, well, I would hope, I would hope you'd ask me that because here is a list. Uh, of a hundred people who over the last 10 years have done better than just buying and holding some index fund, some passively managed fund. But what they're not highlighting is out of every 10 actively managed portfolios, one is likely to outperform the indexes, the passively managed portfolios over the next 20 years. And oh, nobody knows how to know what that one is going to be. So if you wanna be smart, why not just take the one that guarantees you're gonna be in that, in, in that top tier, that top one-tenth, 10% of all managers, you're gonna be right there with them. You know, yeah, they might be a little bit ahead of you, but then you're gonna have nine out of 10 who are gonna be behind you and some of those people who are behind you have underperformed by 2% a year. Be smart. This is a big deal. And it's for the rest of your life, passive index funds. Now, I wanna help you choose the best equity asset classes. Now, 
I'm going to focus for a few minutes on just the U.S. market. I think it's smart to have money in the international markets as well. You don't have to. If you're uncomfortable with it, 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 it's not a huge deal. But it could be a meaningful deal over the long run. We don't know because we don't know how the U.S. is going to fare compared to the rest of the world. Now, I will tell you that people in every country think their country is one of the best to be in. Now, I'm sure that might not be true in Syria and some countries, but of the countries that are up and going and, and, and productive uh, as, as a society, uh, the companies that the country people there have home, what they call home bias. We trust what we know. It, it's the same in New Zealand and in Greece and in the U.S. It's just the nature of human beings. So I'm going to focus for a second just on the U.S. Here's what I know. I know that the average, look at this, the average 40-year growth rate of the S&P 500, I look at every 40 year period. And I start in 1928, that means there are 55. And by the way, this is another table. We'll have the new numbers in next month, but this is plenty of data for you here. 55, 40 year periods. The average return was 11. 13.5 for large cap value, 13.7 for small cap blend. 16.2 for small cap value. If we were here in a, in a classroom, I would, I would offer a free book to the person who can tell me why is this a higher rate of return than we saw in the earlier result that went back to 1928. And I'm going to tell you, because when you do these 40-year returns, you start in 1928, and in 1928, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, you're going to have that as part of your 40 years. But the minute you get past 1933, you eliminate some of the worst times in stock market history. And my view is leave them in. We don't know whether life will have another period like that again. And while I would hope for you uh, that you don't, I didn't in my life, and yet I'm only 79, it could, it could happen during the rest of my life. We just don't know. But I do know this, that the worst 40-year period was a compound rate of return of 8.9, not a loss, a gain annually. The best was 12.5. Over here was small cap value. 19 was the best. The worst was 11.6. And you'll be able to see the worst and the, and the best over here were these combinations of equities. What I'm saying here is if you got time on your side, there is no evidence that you are likely to end up losing money. Having said that, let me assure you that it is not impossible after you save for 20 years, that I mean, 40 years, that on the 41st year, the market doesn't go down 50%. Because in the period from 2000 to 2009, it was down 50% twice. But the idea is not to have all your money in stocks if you don't want to take that kind of risk. More on that later. Daryl Balls, he, he spends hundreds of years each year producing tables and graphs and ways to educate people. And this is, I think, one of the most beautiful pieces for people to learn so easily about how the market really is. Because what Daryl did, we know the returns of every one of these four major asset classes, large blend, small blend, large value, small value, and then the four fund, 25% each, okay? He gave a color to the large cap blend, the S&P 500. 
it's green. I can, in a glance, I can see green was up at the top in the early years, and then it fell to the bottom later on, and then it was back at the top, and then at the bottom, and then at the bottom. I mean, it's all over the place. Yes, it's mostly at the bottom, but remember, it had the worst returns. They weren't bad returns, by the way. I just said they were the lowest returns. So we expect a lot of the years the S&P 500 will be down there, but we also expect the small cap value, that's electric blue color here, it's going to be at the top a lot of the time. But a lot of the time, it's going to be down at the bottom too. Nothing is on the top all the time. Nothing is on the top all the time. And nothing is on the bottom all the time. That's true with individual companies within each one of these asset classes. And it's true of the asset class itself, which is one of the reasons. It's not just enough to own 500 great companies. You want to also have these other combinations in your portfolio. Because look at the four fund strategy. The four fund strategy made more money, about 1.7% more per year, I think, if I recall right, and I'll show you in just a minute. Look how the four fund strategy, it is the kind of this uh, purple color. Look at there it is in the middle. Not the best, not the worst. It just, it, it, look at it still in the middle. Every time I look here, it's somewhere around the middle or a little bit above the middle or a little bit below the middle. So it says at least for the last 94 years, and last year, by the way, it was a great combination, much better than the S&P 500. And that's the way you might want to be. You might not want to be all in small cap value. Yeah, you may have the highest return but you don't want all the top and bottom. You want to be there in the middle. It's a choice that you can make. And now I want to look at some different ways of, of, of showing you how it looks when you start combining these different asset classes. Whoops. I want to show you small cap value as a standalone asset class. 13.4% compound rate of return over this 1928 to 2021. I want to also show you down at the bottom, we said it was going to be the lowest performer, and it was in the S&P 500. Then I want to show you the four fund strategy, a strategy that I just, it, oh, by the way, the difference between the four fund strategy and the two fund strategy, half in small cap value, half in the S&P 500. Anybody who's in the, the, the Western Washington University 403B or 401k plan have access to a great small cap value fund. It's a DFA fund and the S&P 500. And many of you may have that in whatever corporation you work with, have access to the S&P 500 and a small cap value fund. Now, not all small cap value funds are created equal. But here's what I know, that it made an extra two-tenths of 1% over the four fund strategy, which had four distinct asset classes. This one has basically two. And then you could kick out the growth and have only value. That would have been 12.5. But here's what Daryl showed us. He broke the performance in all of those years down into quintiles. What percentage of the time was small cap value the best when they, when they looked at yearly performance in the top 20%, 48% of the time? How about all value, 11% of the time? Two funds, zero. Four funds, 3% of the time. And then you go on down to the S&P 500. And uh, because of the way this thing is, is laying here, I think it's about, uh, if I remember right, about 33% of the time. When, how often was the S&P 500, I'm sorry, small cap value at the, at the bottom? 
a third of the time. Rest of these that are combinations are rarely at the bottom. The all value ended up at the bottom, but it was heavily weighted to kind of one kind, value. So my point is, you have a chance here to kind of get an idea. If I'm on this wild bucking horse thing called the stock market, how am I likely to do? And this tells you. So if you get into something in the first year, you're not in the top 20%, understand, go back and look at this and remind yourself what reality is. I can tell you that a lot of marriages don't make it. Whether it's a marriage to your securities or a marriage to a spouse. And the reason that oftentimes they don't make it is because people don't know the difference between the courtship, the honeymoon, and reality. I'm trying to show you the reality so that when reality sets in, you will know that it's a long-term commitment that at time doesn't feel quite right. And so I will just tell you quickly, because this is one you can dig into later, what Daryl did here is he shows you one year at a time, looking at those five different portfolios. Who was the best? Who was the worst? And what happened in between? Great study material for later. Now, in our work, let me, let me tell you about an article. It was written in 2014 by Dr. Dolly from White Coat Investor, one of the truth tellers in this business, one of the great websites in this business, White Coat Investor. And uh, he had an article he entitled 150 Portfolios Better Than Yours. He has not changed the title, but he's continued to add good portfolios, all sorts of different ways to combine asset classes. Some of you asked me about Betterman. Somebody, I think, asked me uh, other kinds of robo-advisors. And many of those portfolios are right in amongst those over 200 portfolios now. And then there's another guy uh, has a website uh, uh, called uh, uh, Einstein Genius, I think it is. <clears throat> but he has over 200 portfolios as well. These are what we consider to be uh, some of the very best of the portfolios that you can choose from. And there are reasons why these are better than most of those other portfolios, not all. Because some use these very use very similar combinations, but we've tested them, and these are portfolios that we have great confidence should serve you well, and the ride should be reasonable. And what we've done on this page is say, look, there's the S and P 500, large cap value, small cap blend, small cap value. REITs, those are real estate investment trusts. There's international large cap blend and value and small cap blend and value. And finally, emerging markets. These are 10 different asset classes. They all have a history of performing well sometimes and being the pits other times. Okay. That's why we want to have more than one of those unless you have very high risk tolerance, in which case we happen to be a fund of all small cap value, but we also have a portfolio here that's a worldwide all small cap value, half U.S., half international. So every portfolio here, these nine portfolios, I'm going to have ETFs that you could plug in to each one of these boxes. My wife and I happen to use in our old age, the ultimate buy and hold portfolio, a portfolio I've been tracking since the mid 90s. It says, I don't trust anything very much. I'm going to put a little bit into a whole bunch of great asset classes and 
hope that the future looks something like the past. And oh, by the way, if one of these or two of these disappoint, then probably one or two of the others will do better than they did in the past. So this is a lot of diversification. Uh, it is a, an amount of diversification that a lot of people don't want to deal with, but you're going to be happy to see that you don't have to have all that diversification to have a great return. I want to show you ever so quickly, and there's an article about this and a, and, and, and a, a podcast, a one-hour podcast about just this, showing you a study that starts with $100,000 invested in the S&P 500 in 1970 and not touching it, not adding any money, not taking any money out, and it would have compounded to about $23 million at 11% a year. Look at this. If you just took a little bit of large cap value, 10%. So you got 90% in the S&P 500 and 10% in the large cap value. You would have added two tenths of 1%. And you may be thinking, well, you know, okay, that seems okay. I mean, it's better than nothing extra. Well, yeah, it was $2 million better <laughs> than nothing from the previous combination. And then you add another 10%. And this time, you only add one-tenth of 1%. And yet now the portfolio is up to $26.7 million. You added about $1.7 million. Small cap value. You add that, and that adds another four-tenths. Then you have REITs. That averaged one-tenth. And then you add all four of those international asset classes. That gives you a half of 1%. And then you add emerging markets, and that gives you a total of about $47 million. And once a year, you rebalance. And you go back to the comp the 10% in each one. No, that takes a little work, except there are places now where you can have that done automatically. There's a website called M1. And you could actually invest in this combination and, and hundreds of other combinations. But I want you to see something. You might say, why not rebalance more often? You can but you're going to make less money. Instead of 12.6, you made 12.3. Instead of 40, almost 48 million, you end up with about 42.5. Where did that difference go? It went because you were quickly rebalancing and taking from the rich and giving to the poor or those that have been outperforming recently, which are the ones that are normally out uh, underperforming. Is, is, is that the ones that are less profitable are the ones that are more likely to be underperforming most of the time. Well, then what you're doing is if you do it every month, then what happens is you take away from the very, very good producer and put it into the lesser producer, and it gives you a slightly lower return. Well, $4 million or something or five, but, but, but it, it is, a, and, and by the way, this year, we're going to be doing an article on what happens if you rebalance every two years, every three years. That's a legitimate thing to do. And I hope you all, by the way, subscribe to our newsletter. You may be two or three years away from starting your investing. I want you to subscribe now. The cost is free, okay? I want you to subscribe now so you continue to learn. But more importantly, when the day comes that you start investing. I want you to be reminded of the steps that are in your best interest. Now, Daryl, I mean, uh, I'll tell you, this is, uh, Daryl needs a raise, but, but you know, even a 50% raise on getting nothing doesn't mean much. But I'll tell you, the work he does is so fantastic and knowing how to educate people. I would never know how to do this uh, without Daryl's help. But here's what he did. I said, Daryl, could you build me a table that allows me to compare all these different strategies and look backwards and in some way get even a better sense of what the ride would be like and some way to judge uh, wh whether one would be a better combination than another. Now, I can't spend very much time on this because 
I got to be careful. I, I, I have a habit of talking too long. And so I want to make sure I get through my whole presentation here. But this is important. I want you to spend an hour on this table. And, uh, and uh, here's what you got. You got the S&P 500. Well, I point, point with that. S&P 500, 52 years, having invested $10,000, grows to $2.3 million. Let's talk about the ride. Not the ride one minute at a time, but the ride 10 years at a time. We know that for the whole period, it compounded at 11. But how did it do from 70 to 79? That was kind of a bad time in the market. 73 and 74 were disasters. A lot of people swore off invest investing forever because of that bear market. It was a loss of about 50%. So... It didn't lose money, but it didn't make much, not, not compared to the 11%. But for the next decade, it was 17.5. Now we're talking real money. And then the next day, decade, it was 18.2. So what I'm saying is, if you are a young investor, you are likely to have decades that make 5.8. You are likely to have decades that make 18%. And don't think because something made 18% for a decade, that you should put everything in it. And I will tell you, the S&P 500 that did so well during the 90s, actually the 80s and the 90s, by the end of that period, in fact, the last five years of the 90s, the S&P 500 compounded at 28.2% or so, okay? Over 28% people were surveyed. How much money do you expect the S&P 500 to make over the next decade? The average answer, because there were several surveys, were between 20 and 30%. Okay? Why would they think that? Why, if the market has made 10% a year for many, many years, would they think it would make 20 to 30%? Humans. Number one, think linearly. And number two, they have recency bias. There are lots of things uh, emotionally that really uh, get people screwed up in terms of their decision making. So people just put their, took their money. And by the way, if you want to make even more money in the, the last five years of the 90s, you wouldn't do the S&P 500. You would probably do the NASDAQ which then in the next three years lost 80% of its value. But the, the during the 90s, I mean, 2000 to 2009, the S&P 500 lost 1% a year compounded. But then since 1910, it's up 15.1, okay? Now, I'm not gonna go through every one of these, uh, of these strategies. You'll do that later, but I'm gonna just take you over for a second, uh, let's look at the four fund strategy. It's pretty close. Look how it did. First of all, 10,000 grew to 4.6 instead of 2.3. Secondly, uh, it compounded over the entire period at 12.5. A little bit less than the two fund strategy, but, but a good return. But look how it did in 70 through 79, 10.4. How it did then. In 80 to 89, a little better. How it did from 90 to 99, a little worse. As a matter of fact, 3% worse, basically. But then from 2000 to 2009, it did about 5.8% better per year. That is about diversification. And, and, and getting the premium for having taken different kinds of risk. Then he did one more thing, actually two more things. I just, this is so helpful. He looked at every one of the gains years that, the, that, that these portfolios were up. In the case of the S&P 500, out of the 52 years, they made money 42 years. So when you had a bad year, if you knew that, that, that 10 years you were going to lose money and 42 years you were going to make money, would you have panicked because the market went down? 
one, two, three years in a row, okay? That was uncomfortable. Now, I want you to notice that the four fund strategy had 40 years up. Oh, you had two more losing years. That's starting to sound like, yeah, this could be a little more risky. But then what he did, he added up all of the good years, 780, summed them, 787% versus 871%, almost 100% better. Well, close, 80%. He even pointed out the worst year then, or best year, I mean. And then he looked at the down years. What was the average there? 14.1 versus 11.5. Oh, yeah, okay, it had two more losing years, but he was able, in fact, to, to, to have a lower loss in those extra years on average. But I love this. The sum of all of the down years, 141, 138, even though the four fund strategy had more losing years, the total sum of all the losing years was basically the same. That's important information. Now, the standard deviation and the sharp ratio and the Sortino, you know, that's things that the, the, the statistics that, that the expert might like to look at, but they have to do with ways of measuring volatility. So for those of you who do not want to put all your money in the equity markets, we have fine-tuning your equity and fixed income asset classes. You can combine from 30,000 feet. Don't try to look at all these numbers one at a time, but from 30,000 feet, what I want you to know is we have given you, this is Daryl's work, we have given you the S&P 500 right here under the 100% equity. That's what it did every year. You can experience it right here and see all the way down to the bottom where it had an 11% compound rate of return. And you can have all the money in bonds instead if you want to. And you can look at every year since 1970 with 100% in bonds. Or you could have 50-50 stocks and bonds or 40-60 stocks and bonds. You can have all sorts of combinations here and you can compare. And here's where I do want you to look at the numbers. Look at here, 100% bonds compounded at 7.1%. Now remember, I'm looking for an extra one half of 1%. And I'm looking as hard as I can. And I look at this and I say, wait a minute. It looks to me like if I just add 10% equities to a bond portfolio, I have a legitimate shot at making an extra one half of 1%. And if I add 20% and another half of 1%, now it doesn't give you an extra half of 1% in every case. In many cases, it's four tenths of 1%. And then when you get up real high up here, it's three tenths high with equity. But Daryl believes, as I believe, that you can't just look at how much you make. You got to understand how much you're likely to lose. Even bonds have losing periods. The worst 12-month experience, not calendar year, but 12 consecutive months, a loss of 3.7. With the 20% equity, a loss of 8.8. .8. Over here, you can see a loss of 43.3 with the S&P 500. So now, as I look at the four fund strategy, okay, instead of the S&P 500, and look at all of those years, and look down at the bottom, I can see that with the four fund strategy, as I go from 7.1, not to 7.6, but 7.8, not to 8.1, but 8.4, because that particular equity asset class combination, 25% each and big and small and value and blend. And oh, yes, yes, you have, remember the 20% here in equities had an eight point something percent worst 12 months. 
Now you're up to 9.8. But this is one time it happened. This next year, one of the things that Daryl's going to do is he's going to also show you the best three months and the best six months and the best 12 months and the best 36 months and the best 60 months. I mean, this, if, if you have these pages, and we have these pages for every combination, and here's my one of my favorites, the two fund strategy, half in the S&P 500, half in small cap value. And again, here it is down here in the bottom, but the bottom line is you make more money, take more risk. You can look at all the combinations, but then you're going to do what you got to do as the senior partner in your operation. You see, in that business you have with these 5,000, maybe 10, my wife and I have over 12,000 companies actually in our portfolio. So what we know is, is that we are not the senior partner of any of those companies, but in our portfolio, we are the senior partner. And we are responsible for funding our business and then putting all of these companies inside of our business. So I want you to see what it looks like as you fund your business and that's what these accumulation tables are about. And we got a bunch of them. I'm just going to show you a couple of them. But I want you to know that we're going to assume you're going to have the discipline to add 3% a year. So here you go. This is the S&P 500 as the stock portion. And I give you all of these combinations of stocks and bonds. And what I can see, this is important. I can see that by the end, and I show you the annual contrib contributions right here. And what you had at the end of each year, at the end of 10 years, well, let me, let me show it to you in a slightly easier way, okay? We did it for this, for the S&P. We did it for the four fund. We did it for the two fund, small cap value. Now we have these for all of the combinations, but for today, I want to take you to this. This shows for those people in our audience today who can honestly say, I've looked at the numbers and I don't care what the past looks like. I'm not going more than 60% equity. And that's not a bad decision. I'll tell you why it's not a bad decision. It's not a bad decision because it means you're going to lose a lot less in the worst of times. And, and, and so that's good. You'll feel safer, but you're not going to have as much at the end of all that saving. And it's few people that will be 100% equity all the time. Some people will do that. I know in that portfolio that my granddaughter has set up for her, and as soon as our granddaughter starts working, our daughter's going to start taking money out of that account that's for her, her Roth IRA and start funding it as soon as possible. And, and, and the idea of just this money, just this money, it's going to be all equity, I hope, to her whole life. Now, my wishing that it would be that will not make it. And so the risk is, uh, and this is the risk with all money that we give, the risk is that when she's 18, she decides to go and spend whatever money is there on, um, um, on something that, that, that's shiny and exciting and represents a thrill that she can't get out of this portfolio that what we really want to have happen is to give her the last third of her life. We want her to, one, retire earlier, maybe. We want her to do her own funding, too, by the way. We're not expecting this to be the only money she puts away. But that when she gets there, she's going to have a lot of extra money. You can do this with a dollar a day for the first 21 years of a child's life and hand them 
theoretically, and we got a, we got a, an article on this, and we got tables for this. You you could be handing them le- legitimately a a ten to fifty million dollar retirement benefit. It's it's amazing. Time time is such an asset, and uh, and and at my age, I know it probably better than you, but I wish you felt as the time was as precious as I do. But you can see down below here, you can see the decades. And when you see the decades where you were, you can see that, for example, at the end of that first decade, in one case, you had 16,000. And in another case, you had the 20 some thousand. But remember that the reason it's there is because you put away $1,000 a year plus some increases due to inflation. Now, in the time I have remaining, let me just check. Holy moly. America's number one investment retirement uh, investment uh, is the target date fund. For the average person, and a, a, a target date fund is by far the best investment. It allows you to make one decision for the rest of your life. One. I mean, literally, you don't have to do the thing except to say, I want to retire in 2065 approximately. And so I'm going to put my money into the 2065 target date fund. And it is going to be professionally managed for you very conservatively, by the way. And I'm going to show you very briefly how to make it a little more aggressive then they're going to make it and pick up an extra 1 or 2%, okay? This is this is really important, but if you never went beyond the target date fund, you should be well served because you won't get involved. And it's a big deal that you don't get involved. And the reason it's a big deal is because the individuals tend to hold too much money in cash. Individuals tend not to have enough equity in their portfolio because they're afraid because they're being asked to choose these things themselves. But that target date fund, they manage that money just like they were managing a pension fund. They are managing it so that you have a great, should have a good expectation to have what you need to retire on. I'm not saying have more than you need, but have enough. And Wharton did a study. They looked at 1.2 million real investment accounts of people who either did or didn't have target date funds as their investment of choice. And those that didn't have any target date funds but were trying to do it themselves, pick out this fund plus this fund plus some cash plus some bonds, the ones who just put the money in the target date fund made an extra 2.3% a year based on history. Well, if forget everything else I've said about adding other stuff to it. If you could, just by putting your money in a target date fund, do better than most of the people, or let's say all the people in your company that aren't using the target date fund, But if you want to do a little better, because target date funds have too much in bonds, it just makes me sick that target date funds will typically have about 10% of a 20-year-old's portfolio in bonds. You don't want any bonds in your portfolio at age 20. You want to be all in stock so that when the market goes down, you get more. See, that's the way when you read, we're talking millions, the book that that uh, that is free here in just a second, you, you will see that dollar cost averaging makes you buy more shares when the market's down. And these target date funds don't have enough in value. And they certainly don't have much in small cap. So Chris Pedersen, he's our director of research, another two to 300 hours, 300 hours a year working for this foundation, created Two Funds for Life, another free book. He shows you with just the addition of 10 or 20% small cap value, 
it can be a life changer. Instead of putting 10% in the target date fund, put 8% and 2% into small cap value. It's huge. And there's my book, uh, written, co-written with Rich, Richard Buck. Rich and I have worked together now for uh, since uh, the 90s. Uh, but that book is free. Also, as an audio book, you can just uh, click through to your, your PDF and get it. Or you can, you can go to paulmerriman.com slash sign up. You can get it as an audio book or as a PDF. Free. And here's, here's Chris's book. Now, I'll tell you, Chris's book dives deeper into two funds. I do a dive into two funds as a part of, of my book, but, but Chris is the man who invented this strategy. And boy, it is a, for people who will take the time, all the charts and tables and graphs, it's, it's a beauty. It's a beauty. And it too uh, is, and before, uh, we went to offering this free. He was donating all of his royalties to the foundation. Uh, none of us make a penny. Uh, Daryl, Chris, myself, Craig, by the way, uh, you can also build your own target date fund uh, by building a portfolio. You could you could do it with the two fund portfolio or the four fund fund portfolio for the till you're 40. Then start adding some fixed income. You, you could add six percent every five years to fixed income, or eight percent or ten percent. If you're going to be more aggressive at age 40, you put in six percent for for fixed income. Then at at age 45, yeah, you add another six percent. If you want to do that. Stay tuned this year. We're going to be writing a lot about that for our people who follow our work. And here are the best in class tax deferred. Uh, this is for tax deferred accounts, buy and hold portfolio. We have a whole bunch of different strategies with, 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 with the, now notice you can get an aggressive strategy. You can give a moderate strategy, a conservative strategy. This is 100% equity is the aggressive. Moderate is 60% equity. Conservative is 40% equities. We're even figuring out what percentage of each one for you in case you don't want to do that yourself. And then a, a fellow comes along. Oh, my God. I mean, this is, this is kind of one of the, along with Daryl and, and Chris, a fellow joins our organization because he learned from us. He learned from us how to invest. He, he had not been in a position to, re, to put money into retirement, but when he did, and he's a very intelligent techie guy, he took all of our data and he built software to, ab to be able to manipulate the data so he could test it with his numbers. So we have all these tables with our numbers. You could do the same thing with your numbers. And that calculator, after he developed it, he came to us and he said, would you like to have this for free? I mean, what a, what a generous thing that was. And he even continues to, to support it. And, and in the future, it will get better. But I will tell you, people who are willing to take the time, you can do things here. You can use these combinations that we've been talking about. You also can use all the different fixed income and equity combinations, uh, but you can use either real returns or inflation-adjusted returns if you want to. You can adjust the returns up and down. Let's say that you look at something, uh, some combination that, that like my wife and I, we have one that maybe it made 10% a year over the last 52 years. I could say, well, I don't trust that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and deduct two percent off of that. And every year, instead of it, it would turn out at the bottom to be eight percent. Each year would be adjusted, and I could, I could ratchet down my expectations. And you don't have to begin in 1970. You could begin in 1982. You, you could begin right before or right after a bear market. You can make all sorts of custom. Uh, and I just think it's a wonderful thing for Craig to have done. And I just want to point, this is our website, but I want to point out one thing. Right here on the homepage is a, a best advice. 
And when you go to Best Advice, every year we write a new article about the ultimate buy and hold strategy. We update all the data and we do a podcast. So in the coming weeks, we'll be releasing the fine tuning tables, the fixed contributions, the distribution tables. Uh, we will have updated everything with the new numbers. The calculator will be updated with the new numbers. And you'll be able to go to the ultimate buy and hold. You will see again, the podcast, the tables, a link to the tables and a link to the article and uh, about it. And of course you can always, if you wish to, you can email me, paul at paulmerriman.com. Now, as I promised at the beginning, I will be providing a, a response to your questions. And I want to be very careful here. I do not give personal investment advice. I will try to nudge you in the right direction in a generic way. But I cannot because I am no longer an investment advisor. Uh, and so I can only act as, as probably a good teacher would. In fact, a good teacher would say probably, go talk to a professional advisor. And I'm a great fan of hiring people who charge by the hour, by the way. But if when you write to me, if you'd be kind enough in the subject line to put in WWU, then I will know from whence this question came, because I get a lot of them, and uh, I, get, I try to get to all of them, but sometimes it takes a while. But it is a commitment I have to Western that uh, I really uh, want to help. And I know uh, Chris and Daryl really want to help. But remember, we have lives. I get up between 3 and 4 in the morning and start working on this process. I can guarantee you that Chris and Daryl <laughs> do not. Uh, these are both retired folks, and I don't want them getting up at three and four in the morning. But this is truly a passion for me. And so I am doing all that I can to reach out. I know I don't have many more years. One of the goals is to have it set up so that we will, in fact, be able to continue after I'm gone uh, to, to, to provide this. And Eric, I see your handsome face there on the screen. That tells me my time has come. Thank you all. I really, Paul, uh, I want to thank you uh, for this incredibly informative presentation. And I'm hoping to put my own personal recency bias to better use by taking <laughs> another visit to your soon to be updated lifetime investment calculator, among the other free tools. Oh, on your site. I've, I've already put some of the things I've learned from you. I mean, I'd seen them out in the literature before, but your site just distills all this information into these sort of uh, consumable, digestible chunks, right? And, and it's really easy to put, put it to work. Um, you know, like the two fund for, the, for those that are just starting out, that two fund portfolio, the data are there, right? <laughs> Right. Uh, and and so from from all of us at Western and CBE, we want to thank you, the College of Business and Economics. We want to thank you for joining us today, and um, we want to thank the WW Alumni Association for their partnership, and and thank those of you who choose to support the finance department as part of this webinar. Uh, and the recording, as as is mentioned in the chat, there, uh, the recording will be emailed out in the next few days, and please look for an email concerning Paul's follow up podcast later next week. And I uh, hope everybody has a great afternoon. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye.